Now, we used to, our South Africanisms, like, show. I mean, Lance, like, we're driving along, I don't know, and I say, show. And he goes, show. And I realize that that's a South Africanism. He doesn't know what that means. Like, what are you talking about? Show. What, what does that mean? So anyway, so... <laughs> Can I, can I tell them that we are having such fun with just, just sort of analyzing our, our our different cultures and last night was Lance gave us some of our South African visits like, um, you know, just now, just now in his culture it's like I'm there like, like now, just now. To us it's like we'll be there sometime <laughs> and you know, you know in Afrikaans the saying of I'll, I'll be there no no. <laughs> Or net no, or what is that other concept? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yonia, Yonia, what is Yonia? Is it Yo or is it Nia? Is it yes, no? <laughs> but anyway, so he's ripping us off here. So when I arrived here last night, um, he's, he's greeting people and I'm with him. And I am chuckling so loud as he greets people because he greets people like this Hey man, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm looking at the responses because in our culture, you first greet somebody, you first say hi, and then you ask them how are you doing. But you don't start with how are you doing. And what's up is like, how are you doing? And the other most of people say like, you, you, you can't ask me how I'm doing. How can you greet me? I mean, just greet me first. I mean, okay. And people are floundering like, how do you answer somebody who just don't get in my space so quickly. First greet me. Yeah? Just build a relationship. Then you can get in my space and ask me a personal question like, what's up? <laughs> and it was so funny. I was, I mean, he didn't realize it. So anyway, we be discipling on how to greet South Africa. I said, first greet them. First say hi. And then say, what's up? Then you have like crossed the first barrier. Anyway, so so we, we help him cross the lots. Yeah. It's been really great. And uh, I was explaining to him um, you know, what a boot is, for example, on our, on our vehicles that we really put luggage in. He didn't know that. <laughs> you know, they have a trunk. And a trunk is something that an elephant has. <laughs> you tell me, put it in the trunk. I'm thinking, <laughs> what part of the car are you talking about? I don't see it anyway. And, uh, and then the hood. I mean, the hood is like. I don't know, what's it? <laughs> no, it's like something you put it Anyway, it's so amazing. Multicultural, amen? Multicultural. So folks, this, this evening, I'm going to be sharing a short word with you. And, um, and I, this is a word that the Lord, guys, 25 years ago, I was first, I, I first encountered this portion of scripture this way. 25 years ago, I was a new believer, and I was hungry for God. I was at every prayer meeting, every outreach, any church meeting that was going, I was just hungry for God. And you know what, I, I at the same time, I think mixed into that, was feeling the call of God to minister. I just, I mean, wild horses couldn't get, keep me away from anything God that was going on. And and my, my one friend, some of you know, was to the store. Um, the one night he was taking me at Res Fellowship. I was a student at university, second year university, and and Res Fellowship was happening. And he was he was taking he was responsible for the meeting that night. And uh, about the day before the meeting, he comes to me and says, "Jean, listen, I'm taking Res Fellowship tomorrow night. Um, Why don't you preach on Gideon?" I was like, "Oh well, man, aren't you taking the meeting? Why are you asking me? I mean." I was looking forward to hearing what you're going to say. Don't pass the buck, but, you know, I'm a nice new Christian. I, that's how I responded inside. On the outside, it was like, um, okay. My second question was, who the heck is Gideon? I've never read the book of Gideon. And so I go to my index. I'm looking for the book of Gideon. There's no book of Gideon. I don't even know how. I, well, I don't know how I found Gideon the Bible. It's in the, it's in the book of Judges, by the way, okay? But I was flummoxed. I was like, how do I preach on somebody I don't know about? Anyway, I I fumbled through the sermon and I don't know what I don't know what I preached on, but somehow I got asked to preach again and 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 again and <laughs> Again, and here we are, 25 years later. Couldn't have been that bad. Okay? So anyway, so 
so Gideon, and, and about a week or two ago, I just spent some time with Gideon, and I was, I was just reading about him. And it was, it's one of these stories, Gideon's story, I look back and just see the providence of God in that how much of Gideon's story is my story. And I want to share some of my story with you as I share Gideon's story with you. So, won't you join me in the book of Gideon? Ah, sorry, 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 you guys. <laughs> the book of Judges, okay. The book of Judges. Um, we're going to start in Judges 6. I just always remember Judges 6. I somehow found it um, uh, in my Bible, and it's just burned into me. Gideon is in Judges 6. Okay, remember, it's not the book of Gideon, it's Judges 6. And we're just going to read your Bibles. I'm reading from the NIV, and um, um, here we go. It's on the screen. I just put up like three scriptures. We'll get there. I'll tell you when to get there. We're going to start in verse 1. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Oh boy. And you know when you read that, okay, we're in for a bumpy ride. And for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Guys, you read that, I mean, you need to be under serious persecution to move out of your house, move into a cleft of, of, of some mountain. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and the otherites from the eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing. For Israel neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. Guys, that's devastation. I mean, for a rural people, if you know rural people, how dependent they are, they are on their livestock. I mean, you go and take out a farmer's livestock. I mean, that is, that's serious. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. That's a lot of camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. And that verse, I was so relieved when I read that verse. Because guys, they could have cried out to Baal. They could have cried out to any of the thousands of gods that all the ites were serving. But folks, that simple prayer, they cried out to the Lord, changed absolutely everything. And you, you heard him say, guys, sometimes help Lord. Two-word prayer is the most powerful prayer. I mean, forget, there are times I can't forget, I can't remember the Lord's prayer. Psalm 23, I can't remember the apostolic prayers, which I sometimes memorize and pray over you. In times of my life, I am feeling so oppressed by circumstances and some ites and some devils or whatever. I know. There's just a two prayer powerful release that I can just say, help for it. Yeah. And folks, help Lord is powerful. I just, I just want to encourage you. These boys pray, help Lord. And verse 7 says, When the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, He sent them a prophet. The prophet is coming. Can you see him? He's riding on his white horse. I mean, the prophet is coming. Guys, the going to change now. The prophet is on the scene. They cry to the Lord and send him a prophet, okay? okay? Can you see the scene change? I mean, in the movies. Now, you've got to get in the movie mode, okay? Sudden that the, the prophet's on his way. You can hear his horse. Okay. Look, he's going to change everything. Look at this. Okay, the Lord, the, the prophet's here. Okay, let's see. He sent them a prophet who said, no, no, prophet, you've got to say these boys. That we don't need any more words. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Um, I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them from before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. Well, man... You're just giving us some history we know here. And you're saying that we didn't listen to you. I mean, we, we, we know that. And folks, I'm going somewhere with this. I'm not trying to ridicule the prophetic. We love the prophetic. We love the prophet. I'm just, I'm just wanting to make a point here. I am sure that these guys thought that God was going to save them by the hand of the prophet. I'm 
just trying to make a it's kind of a dramatic poetic emphasis here. The prophet actually didn't help them. Now I'm sure the prophet did exactly what he what, what God told him to do, and I'm not trying to undermine what he did here. I'm just going to say sometimes we cry to God and we think that when the man of God comes to visit, this is going to be your salvation. Sometimes, guys, the reality is I know people look to me. If Pastor Jacques can just come and pray for Aunt Lucy, you saw me. I mean, it's going to happen. And you try and get a hold of me and my phone's on silent or I'm in a meeting or whatever, okay, and then it's forget Pastor Jacques. Okay, we're leaving the church because not to my calls, okay? And then, you know, there are times, there are times that the man of God, the woman of God, and I don't also want to undermine the, the fivefold ministry, the, the, the call of God on people um, to, to serve the people of God. I know, that is my call. I am called to serve the people of God. I don't want to diminish it. But there are times that the answer to your prayer is actually not the man of God or the woman of God. And, and, and look at this. And then you think, okay, okay. He prayed for Aunt Lucy and suddenly nothing happened. <laughs> okay, but, but all is not lost. In verse 11 it says... The angel of the Lord came. <laughs> okay, okay, the angel's coming. Okay, everything is not lost. The angel is here. Okay, boys, relax, sit back. Okay, Midianites, you're going to get nailed now. I mean, the prophet came. Okay, he couldn't help us. But now we have the angel of the Lord. Now things are going to change. I mean, when angels come, I mean, this is, this is dramatic. Okay, guys, relax. Okay, sit back. The angel of the Lord is here. Okay, Midianites, you Boys, you're going to get nailed now. The angel of the Lord is here. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak. No, Lord, this is not what the angels are meant to do. The Midianites all over the place. Angel, excuse me, just get off your gluteus maximus, okay? But you not even nail these Midianites. You don't sit down there. I mean, come on, we need your help, okay? You, they, have a, they have a supernatural visitation from the angel. The angel's not helping. What is going on here? Let's look. The angel Lord came and sat and on his gluteus maximus, okay, <laughs> under the oak in Oprah. 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 I mean, there's just, I mean, when you read the story, 
normal, plain Joseph. Okay? Joseph, the angel Lord comes to Joseph. And I mean, I know most of you know the end of the story. I mean, Gideon slaughters 135,000 Midianites. I mean, I'm just giving you the end of the story. You know, in the Bible, if you're serving God, the story always works out good. Amen? Now, sometimes in the middle of you think, oh my goodness, Lord, you've lost the plot. But at the end of the day, the story works out good. But folks, no matter how you try and work out what was special about Gideon, I, I read the story and I, I just look at this and I say, God is trying to make a point that He longs to use normal people like you and me to reveal, let me just say, His Godness. Because you know, sometimes if it's the man of God, it's like, well, the man of God actually, you know, it's like, the man of God is good. He, he's anointed what? But if it's just Gideon, if it's just Josh, if it's just a younger, I mean, if it's just Paul, I mean, it has to be God. Amen? I'm going to see his chance to go out as a see his name and then sorry. <laughs> okay, okay, sorry. Colleen, can you put God for a service? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so funny. I prepared a really serious message. And, and, this, this was serious. and then Colleen messed it up. If you want to know, I mean, Colleen really messed this message up. It was going to be a serious one. Like, seriously serious. And I heard Colleen, I was like, how the heck can I do a serious message after this? Anyway. <laughs> Colleen so showed all the seriousness out of me. But guys, the angel of the Lord visits a normal guy. You'll see what he said. I mean, he, 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 you, you go read on. Well, let's read on. And so here he is. He's threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the millionites. Guys, he is gripped by fear. And the other thing is, you know, I know God looks for faith, and faith is important. But here the angel of the Lord visits a man who's actually full of fear. And he became a mighty man of faith. But folks, look at what the Lord says to him. The angel of the Lord meets with him. And many Bible scholars agree that the angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, our Lord of Lord. Because if you look at the discussion, sometimes he refers to him as the angel of the Lord, but sometimes he refers to him as the Lord. And we just know this is a God of God. Amen. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, Pastor Lance used that scripture this morning from Hebrews 11 verse 3. It says, the God calls those things that are not as though they are. Folks, Gideon was not a mighty warrior. Mighty warriors don't hide in a wine press to try and get your corn crushed to make some bread filled with terror and fear that you're going to be captured in front. And if you read the story, he had big fear issues. He had major fear issues. But yet God calls him and says, God is with you, mighty warrior. Now, I have... The term mighty warrior is what God saw him to be. Because folks, remember, God is outside of time. God saw who he was called to be. And so when you're out of time, you're not linked by time. I may say something to my wife about who she is now as a beautiful 21-year-old something woman of God. Amen? Amen. <laughs> I mean, here's some ladies that just missed a big opportunity to, to really minister to their pastor. But anyway. Um, but I... But, but folks, this is the thing. The prophetic is meant to unlock things in your life that right now might not be a reality. The reality is Gideon was at that moment not a mighty warrior. But God calls those things that are not as though they are. In God's eyes, he was a mighty warrior who was going to slaughter 135,000 Midianites. 
That is, that was God's, that God saw when God, when the angel of the Lord looked at him, he saw this dude, he was seeing that victory, he was smelling the Gibeonites running for their lives, fleeing out of the nation of Israel. He saw it right there. And when you receive a prophetic word, when somebody speaks to you and says, you are an awesome mother to your children. And folks, I have this, this word. Was Lawrence men ministered about some people receiving an anointing for mothers. I, I had a sense that God wanted to speak to some woman here. And you know, I, I actually had the sense mighty mother. You know, mighty means very strong, above average, in, in your ability to nurture and shape and form eternal beings that will influence the planet. Amen. And I wanted to release that outside our on you because I know some of you read this mighty warrior stuff and you think, okay boys, this is for you. But I believe there's mighty mothering. It's not just release that, but I want to release that. mighty mothering on you. That you're going to have a grace to shape a generation of young people that will be so secure in their identity that when the prophetic word comes over your sons, that you're a mighty warrior, they're not going to question God and second guess the whole time. They're going to believe it because you have believed that about them for so long. Amen. And this is the heart of the Father. You know, we've received prophetic words over every one of our children when they were in the womb. And we spoke it and we gave them names and we declared over them. When this little baby is in the womb, they are nothing to nobody. They've done squat for the planet. But yet, we see leadership on them and we call forth leadership on them. And we called various things on them when they were, were in the womb. That is God's stuff. Amen. And so some of you are pregnant with promises. And it's alright if your circumstances don't line up with the promises. I love what Walt Johnson said. He says, God goes into your future. And He gets a word for you today that is going to get you to your future. Amen. Your prophetic word about mighty warrior, that word is meant to get you into the future. God went there, He can see it. He sees you and He sees the future. Amen? And He gives you a word, and that word is meant to get you there. And if that, you know what, sometimes the more that word contradicts with your circumstances, sometimes it's like, God, this has just got to be you, because these circumstances don't line up with that word. Amen? Some of you are saying, mighty mother. Man, Mighty mothers require a father, okay? The dude, God, have you made him yet? Is he alive? I've been praying for him for so many years. And God says, you're a mighty mother. You're a mighty mother. Forget the husband part, amen? There's still an anointing on you to nurture and shape young people. Don't wait for the dude to come along, amen? There are many motherless and fatherless people in the best sense of the word. You know what I'm talking about, amen? We're going to redeem some words. Motherless. Guys, I mean, come on! We need mighty mothers to redeem the motherless, amen? Come on! Amen? You guys, this is the South Africanism, okay? Just explain to us not to the motherless okay? It's okay. Never mind. Okay. So, so folks, but this word, this word, there were two things the Lord said to, to Gideon. He said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. I want to say, that prophetic word that God gives you, the best place to receive it, the best place to understand it, the best place to make any sense of any word about greatness upon your life, is in the presence of the Lord. The angel Lord said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. He didn't just say mighty warrior. Because folks, I believe as the angel of the Lord released that word, he first said, the Lord is with you. Folks, the mighty warrior part only happens because the Lord is with you. If the Lord's not with you, the mighty warrior part will stay a word for a long time. What is that mighty warrior, when you receive that word, it drives you straight back to the presence of the Lord. To God, I need you. This is a word from you, only you can bring this to pass. The only environment within which we can receive a word like mighty warrior is in the presence of God. There are times, there are some of prophetic words, they don't make any sense to me outside of His presence. When I go into His presence, 
They are so believable. I mean, and like Ola, you know, sitting there with his chest stretched, etc., with his beautiful young bride at his side, etc. You know, like Ola always sits, amen. And, and that is what it's like. In the presence of the Lord, all your prophetic words are totally believable. It's like, they're going to happen tomorrow. But guys, I know what it's like. Then you open your prayer closet, your door, and your, your, your little boy comes running down saying, Daddy, Daddy, and he stole my watermelon. And, and then you hear the dog fighting with the neighbor's dog. And it's like, oh my goodness. I, get, I, was, I was just in there being reminded about Mighty Warrior. Yeah, I'm, you know, the, you know the, the world from domestic conflict, etc. There, there are times, folks, sometimes circumstances. And you know what? This is the other thing about, about a prophetic word. And then, oh man, Pastor Nigel, he you out of this. He said, you know, sometimes, sometimes when you receive a prophetic word, the Bible says that the enemy comes to steal it. And one of the ways is, he highlights every circumstance in your life that is opposite to the very prophetic word that you've received. And sometimes that has been the greatest encouragement from, for me in receiving a prophetic word. It's like, I'm seeing the opposite here about all this mighty warrior stuff. The enemy is reminding me about all my failures, all my shortcomings, I mean, everything, every mishap and blow up and uh, thing that I've done in my life, you know what? He's actually confirming the word to me. Because he's trying to do the opposite. And I actually have been encouraged by the opposite. When he brings opposite circumstances and opposition into my life, that's antithetical to the very word that God has given me. Amen? Sometimes he blows his cover. By overemphasizing all your shortcomings, all your failures, all your mighty failure kind of experiences you've had in your life. And then in times of saying, you know what? I'm actually believing the mighty warrior word because you're just reminding me about all the times I haven't been a mighty warrior. That's confirming to me that I actually am a mighty warrior. That I am a mighty mother. Amen? I mean, uh, you know, you get that word and then, I mean, your kids are telling you what a what a what about you and, and all this stuff. It's like, no, well, actually, the enemy's just trying to throw his toys out the cot. I'm actually going to believe that. Amen. And so, it's in the context of the presence of the Lord. All your prophetic words make sense. Your faith is shaped. Your heart embraces them in the presence of the Lord. The Lord said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And of course, Gideon, he, 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 he just, it was whoa, it was mind-blowing. I want to read verse 13. And I actually didn't have that scripture. You can just put the, the next slide up. I'll just put up four scriptures, three scriptures, I think. But sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about? Look the prophet had just been into town telling about all these wonders. Gideon's still thinking about it. This dude was thinking about the wonders. I'm not seeing them, okay? The prophet didn't help Gideon, okay? The man of God didn't help him in this case, okay? Um, when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. Remember, he's looking at his circumstances. I want to submit to you, he had just said, I'm just going into your presence. But he was, he was focused on his circumstances. I love Bill Johnson said, he says, he says, if he's watching the news, and anything that is watching the news overwhelms him or intimidates him, he'll put the news off, and he'll just go and spend some time in the presence of the world. He says, because he refused to be intimidated by the things of the world and the circumstances of the world. Guys, guys, on this planet, we just need a supernatural God, we need a supernatural people. Because in the natural, we just ain't got enough for the solutions that this planet needs. Amen? I, I just, I, I, I don't purpose to have all the answers, all the solutions, but I don't know the God who does. Amen? And there are times that you purposely just got to say, I'm not looking at the newspaper headlines. I'm not looking at the reality of my world. Amen? And for me, guys, there have been times that I have I've got a word, I've got a word that, that God was going to use me as an engineer when I was at university. And you know what? I got that word about three months before I flunked and failed my final year exams. And, and it was, this is what the circumstances happened. I failed and I, I tried to rewrite 
and the next year, and I failed again due to circumstances. It was terrible. I just, I just, it was horrendous. I tried to work and it didn't work. I got a letter from my, yeah, and I tried to rewrite the third time. The university told me, listen, this is your last opportunity to write this exam. You only get two chances to rewrite your exam. If you fail, you will be excluded from the university. I would have passed like 60 courses at varsity, and one I had failed three times, if I had failed it the third time, I'd be out of the university of paying like six million rand, you know, for university fees. Back then it was expensive. I mean, it's, it's just a couple of thousand nowadays. I mean, back then it was big bucks for varsity. And, and I, I would be excluded. I had no degree. My, my, I had a bursary, and my bursary said to me, listen, if you don't pass this, we would consider that you have actually failed your bursary requirements and you will have to pay back the six million rand that you owe us for bursary, etc. And the circumstances were overwhelming, but I didn't pretty word that God was going to use me as an engineer. And so I had these circumstances saying that you're never going to be an engineer. It's impossible to be an engineer. I mean, the one guy, my work colleague, I shared with him some of these things, not Christian, and his words were, he was like, he said, well, man, I think you should take some drugs. <laughs> it's response. It's like, how do you handle that pressure? But I had a word from God that God was going to use me as an engineer. And I, and I had an amazing time for nine years. I worked as an engineer. Really wasted for the call of God into ministry. And, and I passed. And guys, I mean, the test being read, it was amazing. I mean, I worked like a mind donkey at my studies. I, and my lecturer said to me, he said, because I just was going to do EWA exam without attendance. Um, he said, sorry, EWA, I've just marked your exam. Don't ask me for questions. I'm changing the course this year, by the way, third time. Changing the course, you can't ask me for any, any questions about the exam, uh, about the course, etc. Uh, you, you, and, and so it was, it was pressure. I drove down to Cape Town for PE every month to go and meet with guys in the class, get their notes, and we wrote that anyway. The amazing test for me is, we wrote the exam, and it, it was, it was, an amazing exam. Over the first time I wrote structures and actually enjoyed the exam. <laughs> I, you know, it's one of those games like, why didn't he say it's so easy this year? The previous years. <laughs> That's the difference between studying and not studying. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and why do they always do that? When you study, they set easy exams. And they don't, you don't study, they set hard exams. I mean, it's just crazy. They always do it. Have you always found that? I mean, I don't know why they do that better. <laughs> but anyway, and so my structures exam, I wrote the exam. And there was a lot hanging on this. My bursary, the university, everybody. And, um, and I asked the lecturer, I said, listen, after the exam, I said, do you mind just letting me know? Not my mom, just about what to fail. I said, I've got a lot of on this exam. My whole future is on this exam. And the lecturer said to me, very, he said, listen, he was Prof Kratz from Germany, okay? Very good structures lecturer, but I <laughs> 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 No grace, no mercy. It's like, you know, you know, I'll like for why to wrap all that. Anyway, he just said, no. EWA, the external examiner, the smart exam is due. Uh, the, the results will be released end of the year. Um, no, I don't think we the results. But two weeks later, the secretary phoned me. Mr. O'Walter, I would just like to let you know. We've got a first class pass, second highest marking. <laughs> Three months before I failed structures the first time, I had a pretty good that God was going to use me as an engineer. Every circumstance around me. I mean, I had 135,000 million out there when it take me out as an engineer. I'm telling you, I scared them at night. I looked at them. I come to them at night. And all those eyes that were there to take me out. But I'm telling you, I had peace in my heart. I had supernatural peace. I didn't do the drugs, by the way. I didn't <laughs> <laughs> I had peace. It was a supernatural peace. And, 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 and it was an amazing victory. But what carried me through was a simple prophetic word that said, God's going to use you as an engineer. And, and the enemy threw everything at me. And I just had amazing peace. And I graduated and I, and I was able to register eventually as a professional civil engineer. And I had an amazing time. Really rested with the poor of God after nine years. We made the switch into, into, into the ministry. But folks, I want to just highlight what uh, verse 15. But the Lord, he didn't ask. 
how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. You know what that sounds like? It's like, there's a little town in Northern California, it's got about 50,000 people there, it's called Reading, California. And it's not even spelled like Reading's meant to be spelled. I mean, Reading's R-E-A-D, you know, the, the UK version. I mean, the Yanks just, just, just muck the spelling up. I mean, you Google Reading, R-E-A-D, and it's like, it's not even on the map, so somebody stole the city name. And how can, I mean, a little town, 50,000 people, how? How can, how can anything come from reading? How, how about, how about, you know, I stay in my school. You know, it's only a town of 500,000 people, you know. It's, it's in Africa, you know, you know, the darkest continent, etc. I mean, we, we, we don't even have a, a harbor. I mean, you know, I mean, you can drive, okay, there's no sea. I mean, you know, how, I mean, God, God can't use you. And, and, and you know, we, I go to a church that meets in a, in a junior primary school. A junior primary school. I mean, junior. Do you have the junior part? I mean, and God used me from, from a junior primary school in Peter Maris, but there's no harbor. I mean, you know, there's nothing to do. There's no shop. Nice to meet you, okay? You sound like the brilliant candidate to be mightily used to slaughter 135,000 many lives. I mean, you just sound like the perfect candidate. You come from a little town like Peter Maritzburg. I just love to use people from little places. There's once this dude, dude called Jesus who was placed from a place called Nazareth, and everybody said nothing good can come from that place. Nothing they ever did before. I mean, it's historically not possible, amen? You just sound, I mean, this dude Jesus, I don't know if you've heard of him, but kind of got used to him, even though he came from nowhere, amen? If you think you come from nowhere, you're the perfect candidate to be used, amen? You know, if we had a church next to the House of Parliament in Cape Town, you know, we could really influence this nation. Or, I mean, next to the JSB, the Johannesburg, if we could have a church in San Antonio next to the JSB, I mean, God could really use us, amen? But from Maritzburg, <laughs> I like the book. <laughs> Welcome to the book of Gideon, guys. Where people who think they're nothing from nowhere get mightily used by God. Amen? Come on, give the Lord a hand. The Lord answered. I mean, He's given this whole trip. <laughs> The Lord says, verse 7, uh, what? Verse, whatever, where we? 16. <laughs> the Lord answers, I will be with you. <laughs> Guys, the promise of the presence of the Lord. We make a big deal about the promise of the presence of the Lord. Did you know I kind of see it in scripture? There's kind of a thread through this Gideon story. He says, I am with you, mighty warrior. And then he gives this whole spiel about I'm less than the least, I'm insignificant, woe is me, I'm nothing. Guys, that is the thing that sets you apart from everybody else. That is the qualifier for greatness. I know, I know without God, I would have nothing to say about nothing to nobody. But with God, man, I mean, I just, they tell me to preach for half an hour. I'm like, God, that's not possible. Because God is with me, okay? God is with me, I'm sorry. Okay, with the Lord, everything is possible, amen? And so, I mean, I love, I love, love, the, 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 years ago, my pastor said this, he said, this lady phoned me, and she said, Pastor, my husband's left me, and my children have left me, and I've lost my job. I have nothing except God. <laughs> and my pastor said, so what's the problem? Amen? That is the deal changer. I mean, that's just the deal breaker. I mean, having God is everything. Amen? The problem, 
The problem with these dudes in the beginning of chapter 6 is they forsook God. You come back to God, everything comes back together again. Amen? And the Lord answered, I will be with you. And you will strike down all the Midianites together. Man, 135. I mean, you can't count their camels. I mean, this is, this is big stuff. Gideon replied, If now I have found favor in your eyes. Folks, I just want to say something. That God's presence and His favor go together. If you read Moses, what he said in the book of Moses, to this thing. You guys want to turn to the book of Moses. I know you, okay? Exodus 33, where he took God. And he says, and the basically, this connection between the Lord's presence and His favor. Folks, if you have His presence, you have His favor. They're not, they're not, they're not separate. With His presence comes His favor. And so the Lord is bringing these two together here. Now I've found favor in your eyes. Give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Okay. Folks, I just want to say this. Verse 16, I don't know how I skipped it. I was reading on to find verse 16. I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites together or as one man. Now, he, he gets this incredible promise from God. And then he asks for confirmation. He asks for a sign. And guys, I have heard people preaching about Gideon. And you know, later he, he, he did the feast thing. Remember the feast thing? He took, he took a, piece of, a piece of sheep's wool like okay, that has been cut off. And he puts it down. And he's crying to the Lord for a sign. And he says, Lord, if I put this fleece down, and tonight there's only dew on this fleece, this piece of sheep's wool, and nowhere else on the ground, I'll know this is right, that you have born me. And I'm going to take out. I'm going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to strike them down as one man. And the Bible says the next morning he didn't work up, and he walked around that fleece, and it was covered in dew. The Bible says he squeezed out a whole cup of dew from that sheep's wool. I mean, that's a lot of dew. I mean, it was raining dew on that Next morning, he says, Lord, Lord and, and, and I just love this humility. He's not arrogant, etc. The mighty warrior isn't arrogant. Amen. The mighty man of God is not arrogant. He says, Lord, would you just put you everywhere else except on the fleece? Next morning, he wakes up. To his absolute amazement, the fleece is dry as can be. And the whole rest of the ground is soaked in it. And like God's will. We're going to strike his midnight down as one man. And here as well, he also asked for a sign. And I just want to submit to you guys, my heart has been so saddened by believers who are so anti science, wonders, miracles, and the supernatural. And my heart has been grieved. I, I'm in the city, people who are teaching against science, wonders, and miracles. And you know, it's one thing that, but, but what just revealed. That it is out of, in, out of amazing fear. I don't know. Fear of the enemy. A greater fear is negative faith. Negative faith in the enemy regarding the supernatural more than, than, than faith in the real world. My Bible says that if we ask, if, as a good father, if we ask our, uh, our, if our children ask us for, for some bread, he's, he's not going to give you a poisonous thing. So I can't remember. If you ask for a fish, uh, yeah, I mean, something horrible. But if you ask him for something, he's going to ask you. And, and I just, you know, it's an encounter God's confidence. And folks, there are times that you get big, audacious, prophetic words from God. And I don't believe it's wrong to ask the Lord for confirmation. I actually believe there are some prophetic words and prophetic direction God gives you. That the Lord is wanting, He's, he's by that prophetic word actually calling you to seek Him for confirmation. I've heard people saying, yeah, don't look for a fleece, don't do the fleece thing. Listen, if you can find a sheep's wool today, in today's day to do it. I actually say, just, just try it. I'd love something to try it. I don't even know where you get a sheep's wool. But anyway, there are a zillion ways that God can speak. We are walking, talking, receivers from the Holy Spirit. 
I mean, we are, we are like the walking talking satellite dish. I mean, there are a zillion ways God can speak to you. I do not, I actually see my God encouraging us to seek Him for confirmation for the promises of Him. And that just increases our faith more and more. I read in my Bible, in, in Acts 4 verse 30, when the disciples were praying, and they prayed to God that there would be more signs and wonders Poured out. The Acts Church is praying for signs, wonders, and miracles. And I see the 21st century church finding reasons not to believe that the lady whose knee was healed was not healed, and finding reasons why God wouldn't and couldn't and shouldn't heal the lady's knee. And I'm like, what happened in the last 2,000 years? The Acts Church is praying for signs, wonders, and miracles, and the 21st century church is finding like a bunch of skeptical, I mean, like worse than unbelievers, some, some believers. I mean, I, you, you know, I kind of think believers need to. And here is an amazing story. He asks, he says, Lord, give me a sign. And then he says, Lord, and, and how the Lord gives a sign. I was surprised by this. I couldn't remember this part. I remember the police part when I was reading it recently. And he says, hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm going to do your meal. So he goes, and the angel is sitting over there under the tree, you know, they're chilling out. He goes and he prepares this meal. He comes out and puts it on the rock. And go, boom. The Bible says, fire comes out of the rock. I don't remember, I don't remember if fire's going to come from heaven. But I just love that about God. He loves coloring out, coloring out of the lines. You're like, okay, God, here's my sake, but send fire from heaven. And then he comes out of the rock. It's like, come on, God. You know, there's something called the Latin God, you know, because he came out of the rock. You know, fire from me, you know, the scripture. No, it's God. He just likes to color out of the lines, amen? And he got the confirmation. And guys, you know the story. Gideon, he called, he sent a call throughout the whole nation. And the Bible says 32,000 um, men of Israel came together to fight. And the Lord, this is what the Lord said. He said, you actually got too many guys for this victory to be seen as, as my hand, as the hand of God. So you've got to get rid of them. He says, tell these guys, anybody who's fearful and scared to go home. 22,000 guys go home. He's left with 10,000. God says, listen, that's still too many for this to really be seen to be a miracle in my hand. In other words, you know, 10,000 Israelites can take out 135,000 million. I would have said that's still a miracle. But anyway, God says, no. We, say, we need to supersize this. Kind of, you know, you go to McDonald's, the supersize miracle. And then the Lord says to him, he says, no, let the boys go drink. And, and I want you, just the guys who drink with their hands, who don't put all their, all their weapons down, guys who are ready for battle, guys who are... are, are are ready for battle. You see, to drink with your mouth, you've got to go, you can't, you have, you're not alert, to go drink like a dog. Literally, the Bible says, some of them, basically, 9,700 boys drank like a dog. In other words, they drank water. In other words, they had to put their weapons, their swords, etc. down, and their head is in the water, they're not. But only 300 drank alert, holding their weapons, ready for action, ready for battle, drank with their hands out of water. The Lord said, take those 300. Those boys are ready for battle. And then the Bible says, and Gideon is still not sure. Guys, this is the fourth time the Lord asked for confirmation. Uh, Gideon asked for confirmation from him. The fourth time. The first time, the, 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 the fire comes out of the rock. The second time, there's water, there's dew on the feast. The, the third time, there's no water on the feast. And the fourth time, the Lord said, one more time, I need confirmation, Gideon says. And the Lord says, go down to the camp now, take a minute. And Gideon goes down. And he goes he listens next to a midnight tent. And there's one dude who's just had a dream. And he dreamt of a roll, a bread roll, rolling down the hill, hitting their tent, smashing their tent. I mean, guys, a bread roll. I mean, just give me a break. This midnight is filled with fear of the bread roll. Okay? He's filled with fear. A bread roll, rolling down, hitting his tent and smashing his tent over. His friend says, what do you think it means? He said... It is the sword of Gideon that's going to take us out. He's full of fear. Gideon hears the enemy prophesying to him. He gets confirmation from the enemy. Guys, I want to tell you, that's what the enemy does when he brings circumstances that are antithetical to the very word you get. You say, you are prophesying to me about I'm a mighty warrior. Amen? That, the, what you are saying, and the Lord used the enemy to prophesy. That, that's why I say there are zillion ways God can speak to you. Don't, I, I know sometimes we say, God's speaking, and you just think these ears need to work. Guys, we are walking, talking receivers for God to speak to us. Amen? And there he hears these. And, and, and Gideon says, right, we're going to take him out. And the Lord says to him, tell your men, 
They're going to take two things. They're going to take a trumpet. We say, hang on, warrior, sword, mighty warrior, sword, uh, trumpet. And they had to take a jar, and inside the jar they had to put their, their, their candles, basically their torches. And the Lord said to, uh, and, uh, and then he said, divide them into three companies. They surrounded this valley of 135,000 Midianites in the middle of the night. It's in the middle watch, the one watch had just changed. And he said, spread out. And he said, when I shout, you shout. For the sword of the Lord and for Gideon. And he said, you smash those uh, jars and you blow on your trumpets and you shout. And you know what he said? And you stand your ground. I don't know, I always thought they went running down the hill towards them and shouting. They just stood. And the Bible says, terror and fear groped the Midianites as they heard 300 men shouting for the sword of the Lord and for Gideon. And in the middle of the night, they got up and they killed each other and they ran out of Israel as fast as they could. Thousands of Israelites, they sent messages through Israel. Thousands of men arose and chased them right out of the land. And Gideon delivered them. And folks, it started with one encounter for the angel of the Lord. One encounter for the angel of the Lord. Folks, let's not undermine the one encounter with the Lord. Let's not undermine one encounter with God. With a little insignificant God. The salvation didn't come from the prophet. The salvation didn't come from the angel of the Lord. Salvation came to a man who in the end believed God. Who in the end believed that God was with him and that God had called him to be a mighty warrior. God confirmed it four times supernaturally. He believed God and he saw mighty warriors. Amen. And so, I want to pray for you guys. And I want to pray for you. If, you. if you have felt you've had a prophetic word of your life that, you know what, is, is so big that it just has to be from God, but also you've actually been attacked circumstantially, that just lies there. You've been attacked by a prophetic word in your life. I want you to, I want you to stand. Man. I mean, we we mighty men of battle. If, you, if there's been a promise from God that you've had that has been under attack, you haven't seen it come to pass. You haven't seen it come to pass in your life. Okay, the circuit, but you know this is God. And I'm, I want to pray for you. And Pastor Lance, maybe you can also just come and pray. I want to pray. I actually do want to pray for confirmation for you. Amen. You have got four confirmations from God about His prophetic word. About that his prophetic destiny that God had given him. Amen. And I want to ask you to just raise your hands to me. And Father, right now, I have lived this army of kidneys before you, Father. And Father, just because the enemy has been attacking them, Father, we actually turn the attack around right now, Father. And Lord, we receive that because this is from you they've been attacked, we turn that attack around. And Father, I come against the accuser of the brethren. Lord, those lies that they've been subject to, Father, the lies of the enemy, we just break them off their lives right now in Jesus' name. We renounce it. Just pray with me. Say, in Jesus' name. I renounce every lie of the enemy against my life regarding my prophetic destiny. And Father God, I ask that you would confirm this word to me in any way you want to, Lord. I don't limit you, Lord. If you want fire to, 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 to confirm it, do that, Lord. But I receive that call right now. And Lord, I receive the call to walk in your presence. It all makes sense in your presence. I believe it all in your presence. So I choose to walk in your presence, Lord. And we will see it come to pass, Lord. You and me, Lord. Because you and me are majority. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Amen.